What's going on YouTube, this is Brent031 and I'm here at the One Shepherd Leadership Institute. For the first time ever, we're hold, they're holding a uh, semester in West Virginia, so they just formed a Bravo company. So we're really excited to be out here to train. We're about to step off on the uh, field training exercise, which is the final culminating event at the One Shepherd uh, semester. We had a very successful face painting video, uh, one of the last times I came out here and uh, participated in One Shepherd training. So we thought it would be a good idea to do a part two to that. There was obviously other face painting techniques in the world. And uh, Dr. Larson, who's one of the founding members of One Shepherd, he's our uh, subject matter expert here. So I'm gonna turn it over to him and uh, he's gonna walk us through some of the other techniques in the world that he's that he's aware of. So, Ooh. Dr. Larson, Larson, what do you got? Okay, here's what we got. First and foremost, let me say that all everything I'm gonna show you is based in uh, some good science. Um, Thayer, if you look up Thayer and his sons, were working about a hundred years ago, uh, looking at nature and observing that and saying, here's camouflage and how it works in, in nature. Thayer is still referred to as the, uh, the father of, uh, grandfather of camouflage. His work was adopted initially by the Navy, but then by all militaries throughout the world. In the 1930s, the Gestalt theorists in Berlin and throughout Germany started looking at human perception, hearing, sight, and everything else. So, but sight would be the, the critical one. They also started looking at what do humans notice, what do humans they don't notice, and specifically about how the human eye and how the human brain rec recognize things, what they can and cannot recognize. So camouflage uh, matures pretty much from 1910 through the 1940s, and we've been using that ever since. So if this doesn't resonate with you, that's okay. I understand that lots of different regiments all over the world do it one way. Uh, last time we did the British regiment, I was showing what they were teaching in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, I don't know when it changed. I think somewhere around 2000, it changed fundamentally. They just do it completely different now. We had a bunch of old cool school guys going, yeah, look at our Falkland pictures. You're absolutely right. A lot of the young warriors going, that is not what we were taught. And I think that's fine. No regiment stays the same. We all continue to change. But no matter how they change it, the point is that they're still using those same fundamentals. And so um, I want to start off with uh, World War II style and show you how American styles changed. Um, I think uh, one that I really wish I had gotten to last time, so we'll get to it this time, is the Scandinavian S pattern. And then we'll just have some fun with it after that, okay? Outstanding, let's take a look. All right, Les, here's what we're gonna do. So in World War II, they had what was called the T method. And the T method was to simply either take uh, boot cream, whether it was brown boots, you gotta remember it was a brown boot army back then, but there were black boots as well, so you'd see a lot of black cream. And they'd simply grab brown or black, more commonly black, but again, uh, you see brown or black, and they would simply run a T. This was very common. And then you could take it, and they would do a T this way. You'll actually see this. It almost looks like a Native American Indian or something, you know? And that was the T method. Nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, and that's, uh, you know, but as World War II matured, sure enough, you started seeing blacks and greens being thrown in a lot. And so what they started doing was doing like more like a V through here. And then they connected those. And it was not uncommon to see people start going, oh, well, let's just do a V through there, which is kind of cool. Then, so whether you're using brown or green, you'd see the green come out. Or, you know what, I'll grab the black because the black came before the green. What we can now do is if I just push this in here, I can add shadow to this, okay? And so a brown stick, the shadow isn't on top, shadow's on bottom, so maybe we logically want to make a choice here to say, hey, let's grab that shadow and pull it out all the way down, right? Same one on this side, let me do that. We're gonna grab that shadow. I don't care if we cross over or not. And then we're gonna grab that down, pull it down. So what we do is get brown and black. And once again, Gestalt theorists tell us that, while you can say, well, I think Thayer would have told you maybe that black does not naturally occur in nature. Unless you had a forest fire, I mean, you know. Um, but it doesn't, you just don't see a whole lot of it. But what the Gestalt theorists would tell you is, yeah, that may be true, but on the flip side, the human eye catches black as depth. And so any distance, any depth is gonna be picked up as black. 
Now, as we said last time, the human face throws uh, shadows that are picked up as black. That is the eye um, below the nose, below the chin. So you really want to try and use light colors where possible. You really want to use light colors in those low points. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick that up, grab that light colors. And this is where the green comes in. And then pull it on out. A pull is to simply take a color and pull it, of course. But what we tend to do is we tend to pull it out of the low points onto the high points, OK? And once again, we have people saying, yeah, you can, you can put black into a, a low point. You can, as long as you then change the shape of that by doing a pull. So it doesn't look like a, a recognizable eye socket anymore, right? So there we go. This is the basic premise of it. My green is already running out. All right, who used all my cream? <laughs> you hear that in the field a lot. And I don't think they're talking about camo cream. I think they're talking about hand lotion. I was always curious. Why do grunts need so much hand lotion? <laughs> I could think of a few reasons. Well, I'll just say this. They shouldn't use all that hand lotion before reading the, you know, the magazines, the porno mags, because then no one can read them after, and they have great articles in them. <laughs> That's what I'm told. All right. So it matured, and you can see what started to happen was this kind of uh, inverted V. And that's just started taking over. And this is a common pattern you still see. It's a quick, easy one to do. It's just natural to kind of pull down the colors down your face. People even do variations of this on themselves. And so, uh, yeah, that's pretty much all there is to it. It's to break that up. Um, it, and it's weird because what we're saying is we've got a pattern, a recognized pattern of a human face, and we're going to break that by just pulling the colors, pulling the darks and the lights to either side. And this is what we wind up with. Okay, all right, so that's kind of going from World War II and you see it progress to the end of World War II. You're seeing more stuff like this. That's what that looks like. Santiago, can you get me another greens right up there? Okay, so now we're gonna do the uh, Scandinavian S. And Scandinavian S takes that same, you know, monkey face of the shadows here, the shadows here, and it puts, oh, perfect, thank you. And it puts the light colors in first. It says, hey, let's just, uh, let's invert that. My problem is, if you do this by the book, in the school of the infantry, it says light colors in the deep pockets, the shadow pockets, and dark colors on the high bones, you know, the nose, the cheekbone, the forehead, and the chin. Um, and then you wind up with a chimpanzee face, which is also equally recognizable. So. That, you know, if you do it perfectly by the book, doesn't work. So what the Scandinavians did, I thought this was super cool, they come up with this kind of, well, let's just gunk it all in here and then pull it down this way. And then we know we got another dark section here. So we want to lighten that up and we just make this big ass sloppy S. I think that's a cool solution because it avoids the chimpanzee look and yet effectively shoves green or the lighter color into the shadowed spots because then we take it there kind of got to see pull that down here and do the same thing and that's our s then we just come back and we fill in with whatever we want right okay that's it so let me get the uh, other colors no that's the green you just handed me and can do some brown. Hmm. Yep. I'm gonna grab his brown over here in his ear, take that in. He won't hear for a month. Thanks. Q tip will be pulling out this orange shit. That's good. That's good. But don't you let anybody tell you any different, sweetheart. That looks so sexy. After a field op, I used to like to go to the bars. Women loved it. They loved it. Or they loved the $100 bill I taped to my forehead. One of the two, I'm convinced, would work. All right. And then we just 
Do a little black. Fill that in. Dun, dun, dun. I swear to God, I am not drawing a penis all over your face. You'll have to edit that part out. Can't say penis on YouTube. <laughs> I think you can say phallus, though. There's a huge phallic right on us. <laughs> stop. You're not allowed to say that shit. Oh, you're not allowed to say shit. Someone stop that man from talking. All right. Man, that kind of looks awesome. I'm thinking those Scandinavians know what the hell they're doing. Yeah. I like that. All right. Cool. And that's, believe it or not, you see, that just absolutely breaks it is. When you look, there is definitely a penis. I mean, an S right there. <laughs> um, that's just fantastic. And just break it on up. We can break it up further, but I think that's, that's pretty good. Let's see how that works. I threw brown in there knowing that he's going to be wearing a boonie. Wanted to lighten that up a bit. Okay, cool. All right, if I can have you step just a little bit over. I know you're saying, oh, step on the other camo too. All right, I need this, I need this. I'm gonna give you the brown. My last point is this, and that is that we gotta remember where camouflage comes from, or excuse me, let's put that, let's make that, uh, I'll restate that. Humans have been painting their face for many reasons and for war for many, many years. And we didn't always use camouflage colors. We often use very bold blues or reds. And you gotta think, what the hell is going on there? Well, they're taking their warriors, and particularly the younger warriors. And these guys got baby faces, you know? They're not even shaving yet. And they're running out, and they're wielding a sword. They're fighting the enemy. The problem is, they look like they're 12. And so, they would paint their faces with these fierce symbols and patterns to scare the shit out of their enemy. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. And so, just for fun, I'm gonna prove a point. And the point is that we can get wrapped around the axle about, oh, well this pattern or that pattern's better. You know, for this environment, I'd do this, and my regiment did that, and back in the 1940s, this happened. I'm like, that's all fine and well. I need to go just a wee bit higher. Now. That's all fine and well, and I don't disagree, but in the end, camouflage is buying seconds. If you're real, real lucky and good at it, you might buy minutes, but it is not a Klingon invisibility cloak. Pardon me, I'll be right back. Oh, that was so good. That's the British way. Okay. Um, it is not the British way just to smear shit all over your face, and I'm sorry I implied that. Totally the British way. All right. So, my objective here now, I'm being sneaky because you're going, ah. No, he used black in a deep part. And then I pulled it across like he's the Cape Crusader or something, right? Oh, actually, you kind of look like a native Indian, like the Sioux Warriors or something. That's kind of cool. It's kind of badass. I'm going to pull it there and do this. Again, it's supposed to confuse the human eye for seconds. If you're lucky, a few minutes. It's not a Klingon invisibility cloak. It's not intended to be. It confuses you and you buys you that precious seconds to ready your weapon system and alert your team. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna come right down there. Boom. Boom. Boom.
do it on this side. Boom. There we go. Jaws of death. I like it. All right. So there's like, actually, the I showed you four. We started with early World War II, uh, World War I, that transition period with the T that becomes a multicolored inverted V. We showed you uh, Scandinavian method, which is the S, pulling the lightest colors through the dark shadows. And then, just to prove a point, I made a monster, a metallic monster mask out of this. Because in the end, that's what face camo does. It buys us those few seconds, and it's supposed to scare the living shit out of our opponent. We cover up those baby faces, and we make them look like fierce warriors. Let's take a look at these in the tree line, okay? Okay. 